this industry, uh, and and they're taking those uh, those those processes and products and trying to um, to, to to rechannel the focus into the the, the, the needs of society. Uh, there's a lot of new products being developed as a result of all of that research and development. Uh, I, I won't give you any examples, but uh, that is the case. Well, I think the Bible talks about uh, bullets in the plowshares, or I don't think they mention bullets, so do they? Swords. Swords. Swords, <laughs> Swords in the plowshares. That's right. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for all of your excellent questions. We'll have another opportunity uh, in the next session to have more questions and, and answers. But right now, let us continue with Module 2, where Mr. Gonzalez discusses joint ventures. Good day. Modern successful business usually means partnering with another individual or organization through what is called a joint venture. The parties bring resources to this association, such as technology and expertise, capital, manpower, and other key resources to enhance each other's correct operations. Forming an international joint venture requires that the parties not only consider the usual issues involved when entering into agreements with companies or individuals located within their own countries, but also additional issues related to other cultures and foreign law. When you enter into a business transaction at home, it's usually important to have trust and confidence in those you are dealing with. Considerations of trust, confidence, and knowing who you are dealing with are even more important in international transactions. You should learn all you can about the business culture of the country you're going to in order to understand acceptable negotiating techniques and business behavior in the country that will be your host. Remember, you will be operating in a foreign environment. Your partner will not. Before you formalize a joint venture agreement, it is important to understand how the law will impact the joint venture, how the law of the country where the joint venture will be established will impact the joint venture, and the impact of the cultural and business systems in the country where the business is to be conducted on the joint venture. The answer to those questions will provide you with the information you need to decide the best form the joint venture should take. Joint ventures are contractual relationships. There are several forms these contracts can take, but they all have these common characteristics. These are they are business relationships involving two or more persons or organizations. They involve parties contributing property or other assets and expertise in the pursuit of the specific business purpose, and the parties share the profits and losses of the business and also share in its control. A joint venture can be formed between two or more entities through a contract without creating a new separate legal entity, or the parties can form a new legal entity which they each own an interest. It is more common to form a new corporation to carry out business in, inter in international joint venturing. In most countries, the new corporation serves to limit the exposure to liability or risk of the participants. It is essential to know the corporate and partnership forms available in the country in which the business will be conducted and the, provision that the provisions that the law requires, allows, or prohibits in the incorporation documents. There are three categories of transactional documents that are typical in a joint venture. The first set of documents are executed prior to negotiation of the final joint venture agreement. These usually take the form of confidentiality agreements to protect the integrity and confidentiality of information shared between the parties considering doing business together and establish schedules, participants, and procedures for moving forward. Once the conditions of the preliminary agreement are satisfied, the parties are and the parties are comfortable with the relationship as it is evolving, a letter of intent or memorandum of understanding containing conditions that must be satisfied before the parties are finally bound is negotiated. It should contain very general terms and identify objectives the parties expect to achieve. Any conditions that remain to be satisfied and information that either of the parties need should be specified, and it should be made clear that neither of the parties are bound until these conditions are satisfied. Objectives should include the type of entity to be created, the function of the business, and where the 
goods or services will be marketed. It should also contain a statement of the intended level of capitalization and the participation of each of the parties. Any other details important to any of the parties should be included and identified as topics of negotiation that will, will be required in the final joint venture agreements. The parties can use this time to find out valuable information about each other through due diligence inquiries and build on their trust and confidence so that they enter into the relationship with a good understanding of what they are getting into. The joint venture agreements themselves can consist of several related documents or one integrated document. The final form of the, these documents depends on the form of the joint venture selected by the parties. The Charter of Incorporation of the corporation created to carry out the business will reflect all of the elements of the joint venture agreement. There may be a separate stop, stock purchase agreement controlling the timing and amount of shares in the new entity to be acquired by each of the parties. The shareholders agreement can also contain most of the control restrictions of the joint venture that will govern the new company while it remains in existence. The preferred approach is to have one integrated joint venture agreement that is a master working document. This approach cuts down on a duplication of documentation and resulting confusion. Finally, there will be other types of agreements that will be necessary to implement the business. These are documents to transfer assets, licenses of technology, or commitments for services for the implementation of the business of the joint venture. Areas that should be addressed during negotiations of the joint venture agreement depend on the nature of the business and interests of the individual parties. Time periods in which particular events should occur should be specified in the agreement. Four time periods should be specifically identified. The first is a period prior to and through the closing. This is the initial period where all of the organizational matters are completed, including the incorporation of the new company to carry out the business if that is a vehicle chosen. After the closing, the agreement should provide for a startup period during which a business is established and the party's assumptions concerning the business can be tested. If possible, it is to the advantage of all parties to have a startup phase and the opportunity to pull the plug if the venture does not meet the expectation of the parties. The third time period is a time period for which the venture will be in operation and existence. The last time period is a period in which the venture will be dissolved and liquidated, liquidated after its useful life has expired. The organization of the joint venture should first be addressed, specifying the form of the operation. If a new corporation will be organized, the details to be contained in the Articles of, uh, articles of Incorporation should be specified. These include the corporation's name, the location of the principal office of the corporation, and any unusual or unique articles concerning stock classes or restrictions should be included here. The joint venture agreement should specify how the venture will be capitalized. It should specify the transfer of facilities, equipment, patents, trademarks, or other assets in cash that the parties will be contrib contributing. It should also specify the mechanisms that will be used to accomplish the transfer of these assets to the new entity. The joint venture agreement should reflect the party's understanding of the transaction as closely as possible. Any assets transferred should be transferred free, free and clear of any existing claims or encumbrances against them. The financing structure for the joint venture should be provided for. Generally, joint venture partners intend to finance the activities of venture through profits and cash flow generated from the business. If things do not go as they planned, additional funds may be required to keep the business going. Bank loans may have to be secured and guaranteed. The parties may have to make additional cash contributions in order to meet shortfalls. All of these issues should be addressed in the joint venture agreement. Stock ownership and vo voting rights should be addressed. Standard provisions determining the number of authorized shares and the number of shares to be issued should be clearly stated in the joint venture agreement as well as in the Articles of Incorporation. Stock can be issued in a single class or stock ownership can, can be divided into separate classes. The agreement should restrict the transfer, transferability of shares to third parties without the written consent of the other parties in order to ensure that each of the parties are doing business with those they want to do business with. The assignment of management responsibilities in the joint venture is a crucial element. Each party should agree to cooperate with the other party on matters required to be submitted to the shareholders by the law or by the terms of the Charter of Incorporation. 
the parties should stipulate that they will not petition any court for involuntary dissolution of the joint venture if there is a division of the stockholders or the board of directors. The stipulation should be included concerning the right of each of the separate shareholders to elect a certain number of directors. Next, the question of the management structure should be addressed. One joint venture partner should have the right to appoint the chairman of the board of directors and the other joint venture partner should have the power to appoint the president or director general of the new corporation. Under the laws of some countries, but not the United States, unless stipulated to the contrary, it should be remembered that the chairman of the board has a deciding vote in the event of a tie. Stipulations should be included identifying areas of management over which a chairman will have final responsibility and authority and those over which the president will have final responsibility and authority. In some cases, it may be necessary to appoint a president who does not have as much knowledge about the operation of the business as would, would be desirable, but is better in this capacity for political, cultural, and appearance reasons. In that case, there should be a stipulation requiring the chairman and the president to keep each other fully informed and allowing each to ha have equal access to all financial, business, marketing, and other general information. The joint venture should be operated in accordance with a specific business plan that is attached as an exhibit to the formal agreement. Special provisions should be included in the agreement in order to protect the parties from unforese unforeseeable acts that are out of either of the parties' control. In the United States, these, ev these events are referred to as acts of God. Many Latin American countries take a more secular approach and call these fortuitous acts. In all cases, these provisions are meant to deal with acts that are not foreseeable and not within the control of either party. Examples of events constituting force majeure should be included, but these should only be examples and not a conclusive list of those events that would constitute events of force majeure. Strikes and work stoppages are usually the most contentious events some countries find as unacceptable for inclusion as events of force majeure. The desirability of including labor troubles or strikes as events of force majeure depends on the perspective of the party arguing for, for or against their inclusion. A provision should be included for taxes. The approach and negotiations on this issue depends on the effect the tax scheme in the country applicable to the party that is arguing. The, law, the tax laws of different countries vary widely, and the tax implications in the context of the applicable laws should be investigated closely. If the business of the joint venture includes marketing of a product or service, the agreement should specify the area or territory in which a product or service will be distributed. The antitrust laws of the country where the joint venture will be doing business and the home country of each of the parties should be examined to make sure that any restrictions included in the joint venture agreement do not violate the laws of any of these countries. There may be situations in which a company does not wish to have a joint venture enterprise maintain an exclusive right keeping a company out of markets in its own country. The joint venture agreement should make provisions that are appropriate and flexible enough to allow the joint venture enterprise to go forward without affecting the individual purposes and objectives of the partners. Particular attention should be paid to the negotiation of the currency in which payments are to be received or to be made. Recent experiences with the devaluation of the Mexican peso provide an example that is close to home of losses that can be experienced due to dramatic fluctuations in the currency exchange rate that can easily wipe out a party's profit margin. Provisions should be incorporated in the agreement so that each of the parties shares in the risk of exchange rate fluctuations so that all parties are equally protected. Particular attention should be paid to negotiating the place where payment is to be made. If, if currency of payment and place of payment is different from the party's country, or if the deposit of funds is to be made outside of that party's home country, violations of various tax laws may occur, and the effect of making payments in that way should be examined in the context of the country tax treaties, country to country tax treaties, independent of free trade treaties or agreements. All parties should also be required to deal with each other on a strictly confidential basis. And appropriate information should only be disclosed to employees of each of the parties on a need-to-know basis. Confidentiality provisions should be drafted so that they survive termination of the joint venture agreement. The joint venture agreement should contain provisions whereby the parties to the joint venture agree that the party contributing any proprietary information has all right, 
title and interest, the property and material that comes into the possession of the joint venture. The last two areas that will probably be points of contention in negotiations are the governing law of the joint venture agreement and dispute resolution mechanisms. The governing law that will be chosen depends on the parties to the joint venture and their relative strength and leverage in the negotiations. If a governmental entity or parastatal entity is among the parties to the joint venture, oftentimes the laws of the country of those bodies will prohibit them from agreeing that the law of any other country can govern agreements that they are parties to. It is increasingly common for the parties to turn to arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism to diminish the effect of having agreed to the laws of another country as governing the interpretation or enforcement of the joint venture agreement. Companies doing business internationally are turning to arbitration as a preferred method of dispute resolution for several reasons. The cost of litigation in the United States has increased to a point where both U.S. companies and companies from other countries are intimidated by it. U.S. companies, in turn, are unfamiliar with the legal structure and court systems in other countries and are therefore uncertain and insecure about the outcome of dispute outside of the U.S. Arbitration provides a neutral forum for the resolution of disputes, and rules more common in international dispute resolution processes can be selected to govern the conduct of arbitration that the parties may view as less biased. There is a perception that arbitration is more efficient than litigation. Therefore, there is a general belief that arbitration is a faster way to resolve problems. Finally, arbitration is private. The existence and outcome of a dispute need never be known to anyone other than the parties to the joint venture. Arbitration can be conducted either through institutional arbitration associations or on a private basis. The difference is that if institutional arbitration is selected, the arbitration is administered through an organization organized and experienced in doing so. Organizations such as the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, France, the American Asso Arbitration Association in New York, New York, the London Court of Arbitration in London, England, and the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce in Stockholm, Sweden, among others, are available and have established procedures and, and offer guidance and guidelines, as well as technical and logistical support for dispute resolutions. Arbitration can also be handled privately through mutually agreed procedures with no institutional administration, but the parties and those handling the arbitration must be familiar with the procedures and rules governing arbitration. These rules can be confusing and difficult to work with for those who are not experienced with them. Private arbitrations tend to be cheaper than institutional arbitration if the parties managing the arbitration are experienced and knowledgeable with the rules and procedures. The trend of global dynamics in trade today is towards less trade barriers across borders. A good recent example of this is a North American Free Trade Agreement that went into effect January 1, 1994. The parties to the agreement are Mexico, Canada, and the United States. This agreement provides a framework of rules and principles intended to facilitate the free flow of goods, services, investment, and intellectual property across the national boundaries of the parties. When the provisions of the agreement are fully implemented, a single North American market will be created, having an aggregate population of 370 million people. The promotion of economic integration of North America is expected to stimulate dynamic growth throughout the region. The emergence of a single market is causing increased competitive pressures within North America and, in some instances, a serious dislocation. At the same time, the North American Free Trade Agreement is allowing North American manufacturers and other enterprises to strengthen their international competitiveness. The North American Free Trade Agreement provides for a 10-year phase-out of virtually all tariffs on goods originating in North America. A variety of other types of trade barriers such as import license requirements and quotas, have been eliminated through the agreement. For example, Mexico agreed to the tariffication of its import license requirements for selected products, usually luxury items, and to include the tariff equivalents in the tariff phase-out process. Although the North American Free Trade Agreement is called a trade agreement, it, is, it actually deals with a broad range of economic relations besides trade. This is a reflection of the understanding of the three countries that the benefits of economic integration in North America cannot be fully accomplished by doing away with tariff and non-tariff bar trade barriers alone. As a result, the North American Free Trade Agreement also seeks to harmonize national rules affecting other aspects of business 
in order to neutralize artificial differences that may discourage efficient industrial organization. This includes harmonizing restrictions on cross-border investment, on pollution control, and other regulatory costs, on intellectual property protection, and on government procurement practices. The agreement also contains a number of special arrangements for specific industries with unusual problems with strong political leverage, such as the automotive and, te and textile industries. It also establishes an institutional apparatus to oversee and facilitate its implementation. The Trilateral Trade Commission, consisting of chief trade officials of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and supported by a secretariat, is charged with responsibility for the settlement of disputes arising out of implementation or application of the agreement. Apart from the North American Free Trade Agreement itself, accords have been entered into regarding adjustment assistance measures to alleviate worker dislocation during the transition period and environmental upgrading measures along the U.S.-Mexican border. The North American Free Trade Agreement consists of 22 chapters with various annexes, including a tariff phase-out schedule for each product category in the harmonized tariff system. The total document is about 2,000 pages long. The document contains annexes incorporating various, various provisions of the laws of the three countries into the document and reserving specific pieces of legislation and other matters out of the agreement. The central provisions of the North American Free Trade Agreement are those relating to trade in goods. United States, Mexican, and Canadian tariffs on virtually all products originating in North America are to be eliminated by the year 2003. The agreement does not create a customs union, such as the European community, since external tariffs are not uniform, and each country has retained its own tariff rates on products from other sources. The North American Free Trade Agreement also provides for the elimination of most non-tariff barriers in North American trade. Internal tariffs on almost all products will be eliminated within a 10-year period. This primarily affects Mexico's tariffs on United States and Canadian goods and vice versa, since a timetable for tariff elimination under the prior U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement is incorporated into the North American Free Trade Agreement. Tariff preferences are limited to goods originating in North America. In order to avoid diluting the intended benefit, the North American Free Trade Agreement contains stringent rules to determine which goods qualify for preferential treatment and which do not. Essentially, these rules require that the goods be wholly produced in North America or if produced from offshore materials and components, that they be substantially transformed in North America. Substantial transformation is determined by the application of a detailed series of requirements, most of them based on changes in tariff classification alone or in a combination with a value-added minimum. Negotiations of the North American Free Trade Agreement were complicated by fears of massive job loss and loss of national resource control in, a, in certain key areas. As a result, special regimens were developed for certain industries, notably textile and apparel, energy, automotive products, and agriculture. The North American Free Trade Agreement has resulted in a substantial increase in North American trade. As expected, some industries in the importer countries have experienced some economic dislocation. There have also been some cross-border frictions that have arisen based on allegations of unfair trade practices such as dumping or subsidization. The North American Free Trade Agreement contains provisions to moderate disruption and to provide an op optional mechanism for dispute settlement arising out of anti-dumping or con countervailing duty cases. Chapter 10 of the NAFTA establishes rules promoting greater access to the government procurement markets of the three countries. Procuring entities are required to accord non-discriminatory treatment to all NAFTA parties and to eliminate technical and binational barriers. Governmental procuring entities are also required to publish information on solicitation and evaluation procedures and to afford adequate and equal access to such information to interested NAFTA parties. And the agreement's transition rules for Mexico should be considered. Significant barriers still exist in those government procurement markets. Access to Mexico's procurement market where the largest procurers are Petróleos Mexicanos, Pemex, and Comisión Federal de Electricidad, CFE, will be increased from 50% in the first year of the agreement to 100% in 10 years.
The North American Free Trade Agreement's rules are not, however, applicable to state, municipal, or local procurements, or to procurements below specified dollar thresholds or procurements otherwise exempt for national security or other reasons. Chapter 17 of the agreement contains standards to ensure improved protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. In addition to requiring that each country give national treatment to nationals of another NAFTA country, it imposes high standards for the protection of patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Specific protection is also provided for integrated circuits and industrial designs. Chapter 11 requires each of the countries to extend national treatment to the flow of investments to or from each of the other countries. That is, the regulation of North American countries with respect to the establishment, acquisition, and operation of a business must be non-discriminatory among the NAFTA members. The maintenance of restrictive performance regulations as prerequisites and barriers to investments, such as Mexico's minimum domestic ownership, local content, and export performance requirements is prohibited. Certain investment restrictions tied to national security and, in the case of Mexico, to investment in oil and natural gas exploration are exempt from this chapter. Chapter 12 is designed to increase access to the service markets of each country by requiring, with certain exceptions, national and most favored nation treatment and improved transparency. The parties have also agreed to liberalize and increase the transparency of licensing and certification requirements of nationals of other NAFTA countries. Chapters 13 and 14 of the NAFTA provide special rules for promoting greater access to telecommunication and financial services markets, including the reduction and eventual elimination of Mexico's foreign ownership restriction on banks, securities firms, and insurance companies. Latin American free trade integration is moving forward region-wide. Mexico has signed free trade agreements already with Colombia, Chile, Venezuela, and other interested nations. International business and technology will be flowing faster. On a more global scale, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, known as the GATT, was created back in 1947. The GATT has been described as the most comprehensive commercial agreement ever concluded between sovereign nations. The GATT incorporates the rules of trade among nations. The cornerstone of these rules is a most favored nation principle of levying import duties and applying rules associated with imports. Other material provisions of the agreement include a national treatment requirement, restrictions on the use of quotas and trade diverting subsidies, rules governing dumping duties and obligations with respect to tariffs, the fair valuation of goods for customs purposes, and reasonable marks of origin. Since 1947, there have been eight rounds of multilateral trade negotiations under the auspices of the GATT, including the Uruguay Round. On April 15, 1994, the final act of the Uruguay Round was signed by representatives of 111 governments. The Uruguay Round was initiated at a meeting of the GATT trade ministry, ministries at Punta del Este, Uruguay, in September 1986, and the negotiations were completed in December 1993 in Geneva, Switzerland. <clears throat> the final act incorporates the texts of all the agreements negotiated and of related ministerial decisions and declarations. Tariff cuts alone are expected to put about $235 billion a year into the world economy over the next 10 years. The U.S. Congress passed President Clinton's legislative proposal to implement the Uruguay Round agreements in December 1994. The countries that comprise the contracting parties to the GATT negotiated the creation of the World Trade Organization. The purpose of the World Trade Organization is to oversee trade relations and to provide a common institutional framework for the operation of the GATT, promoting a more variable and durable multilateral trading system encompassing the GATT, the results of pay past trade liberalization efforts, and all of the results of the Uruguay Rounds round of multilateral trade negotiations. The 1994 GATT is legally distinct from the 1947 GATT because contracting parties to the original GATT may choose not to become members of the World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization members bind themselves to many agreements, including agreements covering trade in goods, certain sector-specific agreements, agreements regarding sanitary and phytosanitary, which are environmental measures, intellectual property agreements, 
and dispute settlement agreements. The World Trade Organization provides increased credibility and predictability for the international trading system. Least developed countries, as recognized by the United Nations, may also become members with the requirement that they undertake commitments and concessions to the extent consistent with their individual development, financial and trade needs, and their administrative and institutional capabilities. The agreements result in tariff reductions from countries that represent approximately 85% of world trade. Tariff reductions generally will be phased in over a five-year period starting no later than July 1st, 1995. Tariff rates for some product groupings will drop to zero immediately upon implementation, but in certain other cases, a phase-out period will be 10 years. The agreement on safeguards contains measures that provide relief when GATT obligations or tariff concessions cause or threaten severe economic in in injury to domestic industries through a rapid or disruptive increase in imports. These measures may include increased tariffs or quantitative, quantitative restrictions. An agreement on subsidies and countervail countervailing measures is also included. The agreement defines subsidy as a benefit conferred by financial contribution, transfer of funds or goods, or debt forgiveness, or by a foreign or public body within a territory of a member. Before action can be taken against a subsidy under the terms of the agreement, the subsidy must be specific to an enterprise or industry. The agreement provides guidelines for this determination and creates various categories of subsidies on multilater multilateral remedies. The NAFTA, the GATT, and other trade agreements throughout the Western Hemisphere have increased the opportunities for individuals and companies from different countries, cultures, and legal systems to do business together. The Americas are marked by sharp legal contrasts, primarily due to competing historical influences of the early Spanish, French, and English explorers, but many similar similarities exist. International transactions are spanning the globe, causing a further mi mix of cultures, customs, languages, traditions, and laws. Businessmen embarking on international ventures need professional support from lawyers and accountants with resources, experience, skills, and expertise that reach beyond the borders of their home countries. Technology transfer and, and adaptation is a much more common process today in our communities. The so-called information superhighway will be fueling this phenomenon. Professional firms that have close correspondent relationships with quality legal and accounting firms or offices of their own in the country where the business will be operated are an essential element of a team to carry out a sophisticated international business enterprise. Lawyers and accountants provide information regarding local conditions, laws, and regulations. This information is critical if foreign commercial ventures are to succeed. The role of the lawyers and CPAs in international transactions goes beyond giving legal and accounting advice. Commonly, the advice given by the lawyers and accountants relates to foreign business and investment matters. Locating, selecting, and working with foreign professionals can be difficult and challenging. There are many differences between countries' substantive and procedural law, the organization of the professions, and cultural mores and social customs. Oftentimes, the differences are not apparent, making it, making it easy to make basic mistakes. Little practical guidance is available. The common law traditions of the United States and Canada are much different than the civil law traditions of Mexico and the countries of Central and South America. Also, it is important that professionals that are engaged either speak the language of the foreign country in which a business